Hi everyone, I'm Florence Sutcliffe Braithwaite. I'm a lecturer in 20th century British history here at UCL. And in this short film, I'm going to introduce you to one of the primary sources um, that I work with um, in one of the courses that I teach, uh, which is a second and third year course um, called Queer Histories of Britain from the 1980s to the 1990s. Uh, so this primary source is a film that was produced in 1960, and it's a docudrama of the three trials of Oscar Wilde, um, and it was produced by Granada TV as part of their On Trial series, which um, included lots of dramatisations of historical trials. So first of all, I'm just going to give you a little bit of um, background introduction to Oscar Wilde himself. He's obviously quite a well-known figure. Um, but there are some aspects of his, his life, his biography, that are more well-known than others. So, uh, Wilde was an Anglo-Irish intellectual. Uh, he was a journalist, a writer, and a leading advocate of the aesthetic movement, um, which emphasised beauty above all else in art. He'd had a, a brilliant undergraduate career in classics, especially Greek, uh, and he flirted with converting to Catholicism as an undergraduate and um, retained a lifelong interest in Catholicism. Other important influences on him as an undergraduate and indeed later uh, were figures such as Walter Pater and John Ruskin, both of whom emphasised the importance of aesthetic beauty. Ruskin, of course, went further and suggested that beauty must be allied to morality in art, and this was a, a kind of key issue that interested Wilde throughout his, his life and his artistic career. Wilde was married to Constance Lloyd and had two sons. And in the early 1890s, his career as a, a lecturer, journalist, writer um, and playwright really took off. Um, he became one of London's most famous playwrights in this period, um, with plays such as, famously, The Importance of Being Earnest. In 1891, he was introduced to Lord Alfred Douglas, a uh, much younger man, um, a beautiful undergraduate with whom he began a, a very close and intense relationship and through Douglas and others Wilde was introduced to London's kind of seedy underworld of uh, male prostitution and um, drag. Now uh, Lord Alfred had an extremely difficult relationship with his father the Marquis of Queensbury who came to be suspicious of and um, very hostile to his relationship with Wilde and, and really started to um, sort of uh, persecute Wilde and his son. This all came to a head in 1895 when Queensbury, as you'll see in the film, uh, left a card for Wilde at his club, which said for Oscar Wilde, posing as a sodomite. So Wilde, at this point, sued the Marquis of Queensbury for libel, and this gave rise to the first trial, which opened on the 3rd of April, uh, 1895. Because Wilde had, had sued for libel, Queensbury's lawyers tried to prove that, in fact, what Queensbury had said was the truth, that Wilde was indeed a sodomite. And so they uh, sought evidence um, by uh, seeking out younger men who would um, testify that Wilde had lured them and corrupted them. And they also brought forward letters um, that Wilde had written to Lord Alfred Douglas um, in a kind of florid, um, very emotional style as evidence. Ultimately, Wilde dropped this trial because it seemed like it was going very badly and it seemed like he would lose. Queensbury was thus found not guilty, leaving Wilde liable to pay his costs in the trial, which would have left Wilde bankrupt. Uh, some of his friends urged him to flee to France, but he didn't and he was soon arrested on charges of gross indecency. This gave rise to the second and third trials, which you'll also see in the dramatisation. The second trial, in fact, uh, led to a hung jury. The jury couldn't make up their mind. Um, but the third trial ultimately led to Wilde being convicted of gross indecency and sentenced to two years hard labour. He served a lot of that sentence in Reading Jail, um, giving rise to uh, his famous work, The Ballad of Reading Jail, Conditions in the, the jail were very hard. He was in solitary confinement. He had to do hard labour. Um, and on his release, uh, Wilde went to France, but he was in pretty bad health after his release from prison, um, and he died just a few years later in 1900. 
So that's a little bit of background to, to Wilde and his trials. Um, but the other thing that's important to understand in order to, um, to look at this source is the 1885 Criminal Law Amendment Act, which was the act which introduced the idea of gross indecency as a criminal act um, in English law. So let me just tell you a little bit about this act and the background to it. Sodomy had in fact been a crime in English common law since 1533. Before that it was a crime but it was dealt with by the ecclesiastical courts. So after the 1533 it was punishable by death in fact until 1861 thereafter it was punishable by 10 years to life imprisonment. But, of course, this law um, and the, uh, the nature of the offence of sodomy uh, was quite inexact. It was difficult to prove, and these very harsh punishments um, meant that it was not a crime that people were that often convicted of. The work of Harry Cox, um, who's a really important historian of sexuality, uh, shows that the law had been interpreted with some latitude, so that particularly since the, the 18th century, it was not only the act which we might now consider to be definitive of sodomy, i.e. anal sex, that was counted. Um, so the law had been used to prosecute other types of acts, in fact quite, quite a variety of acts. But what changed in 1885 with the introduction of the Criminal Law Amendment Act of that year was that any act of what was termed gross indecency between two men in public or private was now a crime. So this term gross indecency was left completely undefined um, in the law. That's sort of probably a result of the fact that it's quite difficult um, for all the Victorians to sort of speak openly about what they really meant when they were talking about um, these kinds of matters. Nevertheless, gross indecency, this, this vague, ill-defined term, could really be used to capture a whole range of different sexual acts between men. So even though there's some kind of debate among historians about how much really changed in 1885, um, it is clear that this change in the law did um, make it clear that you could really prosecute men for a whole variety of different acts, not um, that it was not um, in any way sort of limited. Uh, and the explicit introduction of this, um, this phrase, in public or private, into the law was also really significant because um, the fact that it was a, a, an offence to commit these acts in private as well meant that uh, any man who was committing any kind of sexual act with another man, even in private, was laying themselves open to potential blackmail. So this act mm -hmm. did become known as the Blackmailer's Charter. So the 1885 Criminal Law Amendment Act remained in force in Britain uh, until uh, 1967, so a, a very long time. Um, and that kind of leads me to the, the third area of background that I want to give you, because this primary source um, was, was created in 1960. And so it's quite interesting to think about it, I think, as a source that tells us not only potentially something about the wild trials, but also potentially something about the issue of homosexuality uh, in Britain in 1960. So, what was sort of going on in relation to homosexuality and the law in post-war Britain? So, after the end of the Second World War in 1945, um, there was a period of um, social anxiety, such as often uh, sort of accompanies the end of conflict. Um, one part of that was a, a kind of growing public anxiety about the issue of homosexuality, which led to an increase in prosecutions for gross indecency in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Then in the mid-1950s, a number of um, high-profile cases brought the law uh, on gross indecency really into question. So in particular, perhaps the most famous of these uh, came in 1954 um, with the prosecution of Peter Wildblood. Uh, who was the dip diplomatic correspondent for the Daily Mail, along with a couple of other high-profile figures um, for gross indecency. Now, Wildblood was a, a kind of eminently respectable figure. He was really a member of the establishment. Nevertheless, he was prosecuted for this offence, um, and very dramatically, in court, he stood up and rather than denying it, he said, no, I am, in fact, a homosexual. 
So this was a really kind of dramatic moment, and he followed it up a year later with uh, the publication of a book called Against the Law, in which he reiterated his case, which was that he could not help being homosexual. And therefore, as long as he uh, uh, conducted himself in a manner that did nothing to outrage public morality, he should not be persecuted, but merely left to do as he wished in private. Um, he wasn't really saying that um, homosexuals sh should be kind of out and proud, that way of thinking about homosexuality didn't really exist yet. What he was actually more saying was that this was natural, but it was something to be kind of pitied. Nevertheless, people like him should be allowed to do as they wished in private, as long as they weren't hurting anyone else or outraging kind of public morality. So this case and various other similar cases uh, helped to spark the setting up of uh, the Wolfenden Committee by the government. Um, this was designed to report on the law relating to uh, homosexuality and also prostitution, interestingly enough. Uh, when it came to report on homosexuality, what the Wolfenden um, Committee actually recommended was something really uh, relatively um, novel, that is they seem to kind of be convinced by the sort of argument that um, someone like Wildbud was making that homosexuality should not uh, be a matter for the law where it took place only in private between men. Homosexuality between men should be a matter for public concern if it took place in public, but it should be decriminalised where it took place in private. In the short term, this didn't have much effect. Uh, it wasn't put into law in the short term, but it did have the effect of um, kind of providing a stimulus um, and a, a rallying point for groups to start organising around in order to try and, and push for decriminalisation of homosexuality between men. So uh, in particular, 1958 saw the formation of the Homosexual Law Reform Committee, which kind of went public um, in 1960 and became the Homosexual Law Reform societies. This was um, really one of the first major um, groups set up in Britain to campaign for the decriminalisation of homosexuality between men. But it wasn't until 1967 that these recommendations were actually acted on by what was then a Labour government, which gave time to a backbench bill introduced by the MP Leo Absey uh, to pass through um, the House, House of Commons and the House of Lords. Um, so this was the Sexual Offences um, Act of 1967, which decriminalised um, sexual acts between men in private. It wasn't perhaps quite as um, liberal as we might now sometimes assume. When we look back, it's often described as the moment of the legalisation of homosexuality, but it's important to remember that there were still a lot of really important um, kind of caveats put on the law. So, for example, where the age of consent for heterosexual sex um, was 16 at the time, um, the age of consent was set for sex between men at the age of 21. So this was very far from a kind of equalisation. So, so this film, um, The Trial of Oscar Wilde, was made in 1960 when there was increasing public debate about homosexuality. And interestingly, um, in fact, there were two other films um, which were feature films and not purporting to be um, kind of factual docudramas in the same way that, that this film was, that came out about Oscar Wilde in, in exactly the same year. So 1960 saw three films about Oscar Wilde, which certainly suggests something uh, about a kind, of, a kind of public interest in this story and this figure at this moment in time. So I've got, I've got a couple of questions um, that I want to pose about this film. First, a couple of questions about... Um, the film itself and this moment of, of 1960. So the film goes to great lengths to convince the reader that it is a kind of strictly factual rendering of the trials. So the first thing that I want to think about is how does it do this and why, uh, and then um, how truthful in fact is it? Uh, and the second question um, that I want to think about um, in relation to the film is quite simply what, what it tells us about attitudes towards homosexuality in Britain in 1960, how kind of explicit or implicit um, are, are questions of homosexuality in this film. And then I've got a kind of couple of questions that I want to pose relating to Wilde himself. So uh, first of all, 
what is Wilde talking about when he describes in this speech that's become quite famous, um, the love that dare not speak its name. What exactly is Wilde speaking about there? The second is, you know, why was Wilde convicted? The film offers uh, one suggestion at the end, but is that um, an adequate explanation of the conviction of Wilde? Then the third question is um, relates to gender as well as sexuality. So you'll probably notice in the film there are a number of, of references to the language of gender, of masculinity and femininity, um, as well as references to sexuality. Um, so one of the things that I want to think about is how these two languages are, are kind of tied up together in the 1890s um, and, and kind of what the significance of that is. And then finally, my final question about Wilde is, um, Wilde is often in the late 20th century been seen as a kind of tragic gay icon or a, a kind of gay martyr. And so the final question that I want to pose is, to what extent is that kind of view of Wilde uh, borne out or, or not borne out by watching this film. Thanks very much. <laughs>